This week in Linux, the much-anticipated Cosmic Desktop is here. Well, kind of. GNOME have finally added back a feature that people have been asking for for years. Or did they? <laughs> Manjaro is working on an immutable version of their distro. And that's true, they are. All of this and more on This Week in Linux, the weekly news show that keeps you up to date with what's going on in the Linux and open source world. So let's jump right into your source for Linux good news. This week in Linux, the Cosmic Desktop is finally here. Well, sort of. It is currently released as an alpha or technical preview, and it's not ready for production use just yet, but I did try it out, and I gotta say, this is a very exciting desktop with a ton of potential. System76 announced this week the alpha release of Pop! OS 2404 LTS, which comes with the alpha of the new Rust-based Cosmic Desktop environment. Pop! OS 2404 LTS is, of course, based on Ubuntu 2404 LTS, which means it is going to inherit a lot of value from that base, including significant updates to underlying packages, tooling, libraries, and core technologies. But of course, the new Cosmic Desktop is going to steal the show, of course, for this particular episode and really for any time we talk about it from this point forward. For those unfamiliar, Pop! OS 2204 and previous releases had something called Cosmic, but it was based on GNOME using the extension system to modify the experience. System76 decided they wanted to create a new desktop environment for a variety of reasons, but one of the biggest being the limitations the previous structure had because GNOME has a lot of great things about it, but at some point, extensions were just not enough. As I said, I have tried out the Cosmic Desktop and it is very impressive so far. There are a lot of cool features and ideas in this desktop. You can check out the video I made about the new desktop, which is linked in the show notes for my full first impressions. But for now, here's a quick look at what makes Cosmic so interesting. A lot of what is good from the GNOME version of Cosmic is here in the new desktop, such as the workspace system that so many love from Pop! OS, and also Cosmic brings over the tiling window management that Pop! OS is known for. The coolest thing about these things is that the flexibility of them. For example, by default, the workspaces are presented in a vertical layout. But if you want to have them in a horizontal layout, well, you can do that. And for the tiling, most of the time, desktops offer either a tiling-first experience or a floating-first experience. It is rare that you will see a desktop that offers both of these things in like a full implementation of both floating and tiling. But that is what you get with Cosmic. You can have floating activated and easily tile all of the windows instantly with a toggle in the top panel, or you can have everything tiled and pull one window out of the tiling to use it as a floating style if you want to. They even added the ability to do window stacking and so much more. So the flexibility is here and is very exciting to me. The coolest thing about this though is that all of the features of workspaces and tiling are per workspace and per monitor. Right, So if you have multiple monitors, then you can have different workflows on each monitor and you can have different panels and docks and stuff on each workspace. Really cool. The top panel also gives really quick access to various functions like Bluetooth, networking, sound control, and thankfully, it actually supports system tray menus, unlike some desktops. Looking at you now, this new desktop Environment also will include their own Rust-based apps such as File Manager, Text Editor, Store, Terminal, Settings App, and many more. Now, Cosmic is powered by Wayland, so you get fractional scaling for high-resolution monitors, support for X Wayland to run legacy apps, variable refresh rate, so if you have multiple monitors that have different refresh rates, they will also work as expected in Cosmic. There's also a lot of care given for accessibility in the new desktop. During the press conference that System76 had, they had well, they had a Q&A where I asked about accessibility and a lot was discussed there. So I was very happy to see that they have put a lot of effort and thought into making sure that Cosmic is accessible as possible. Though this is an alpha release, so that isn't quite fully baked in yet, but I'm happy to see that they are including it 
and especially in the beginning stages of the of the development. Now, System76 has had this to say about the alpha release of Cosmic. System76's new desktop environment began as a replacement for GNOME as a way to reimagine the desktop environment and the value it can provide users across the Linux ecosystem. They also go on to say, some differences of note include a comprehensive theming system with shareable themes, an option for vertical or horizontal workspaces, an integrated and easily accessible tiling system, and highly customizable panels, docks, and that top bar, that sort of thing. Now, Cosmic is not exclusive to Pop! OS. Linux distros that want to offer will be able to do that, and some are already working on it, like Fedora Linux has a work on it, OpenSUSE, Arch Linux, Serpent OS, and Nix OS, as well as some BSDs and Redox OS. Now, Cosmic Desktop is also coming with a lot of power user features, like an app launcher, similar to KDE Plasma's KRunner. Uh, I think Cosmic Desktop is going to be a great option for developers and power users when it finally gets to the full stable release. As for when that will be, we don't know yet. Well, I will, of course, keep you updated, so be sure to subscribe. But in the meantime, you can check out the video I made about my first impressions with Cosmic. I'll link it below. This week in Linux, OMG Ubuntu reported that GNOME has released a brand new official extension for the long requested support of system tray icons being available in GNOME. Now, there has been multiple solutions for this for many years. Many extensions have addressed this problem, but GNOME has always held steadfast that they would not support this feature. And yet now, here we are. Seven years after GNOME removed this functionality from their desktop, and told people to use third-party extensions, they now have merged a new official GNOME shell extensions for tray icons. Is it time to celebrate? <laughs> Not so fast. I was very happy to see this news, but that excitement quickly turned to disappointment. While it is great that GNOME is finally offering this kind of extension, it's using the old X-Embed protocol, which does not work on GNOME Wayland because XEmbed is incompatible with GNOME Wayland. This protocol does work on Plasma Wayland, but that's because they have a background service converting XEmbed to status notifier items protocol. But this kind of thing does not exist for GNOME. So the GNOME shell only exposes XEmbed when running GNOME on X11, which is weird because GNOME, of course, defaults to Wayland in most distros. So what does this mean? Well, it means that in order to use this official extension, you would need to switch to the X11 version of GNOME, which is odd since there is expectation that GNOME will be phasing out X11 support entirely at some point and is already the default for Wayland for a long time. The question then becomes, well, maybe this is temporary and they will support app indicators, which do work in Wayland. Well, not so fast. When asked about this, they said, this is leveraging the X-Embed support in GNOME Shell. If we get a better standard at one point, we may support it, but app indicators are not it, and there is no plan on supporting them. By the way, that question was asked by Neil Gompa. If you don't know, Neil is one of the co-hosts of the Pseudo Show, which is also on the Tux Digital Network, so go check them out. Now, the GNOME developer who added this extension is saying they have no intention to support app indicators. So my next question is, what's the point of this extension? Let me see if I can get this straight. Seven years ago, GNOME decided that tray icon menus were bad, so they removed them. And they told users, uh, use an extension, ignoring that getting started with extensions in GNOME is needlessly difficult. Now, GNOME has since recognized that users do want this, and instead of adding it back to the default experience of the desktop, they added an extension that only supports a protocol that the default GNOME experience doesn't work with. Hmm. Anyway, there's a lot of cool things about GNOME, but this is not one of those things. If you're looking for this feature, third-party extensions are still the only way to do it, as far as I know. The Manjaro Linux team have announced that they are working on an immutable version of their distro. Immutable Linux distros have been very popular as of late. Last week, we covered the latest release of Vanilla OS on this show. And of course, there's also Fedora Silverblue, OpenSUSE Aeon, uh, Bazite, NixOS, and more, including Canonical talking about making something potentially an immutable version of Ubuntu. 
Now, Manjaro is dipping their toes into the water with their own attempt at an immutable version. Now, this immutable Manjaro Linux is built around ArcDep as developed by the Arcane Linux distribution. The ArcDep toolkit allows building, deploying, maintaining immutable and atomic systems built on top of the Butter, ButterFS file system. This immutable Manjaro Linux has not yet reached its final form, so it is considered experimental. Eventually, the developers do hope that this immutable version of Manjaro Linux will become an official variant, but it is not intended to be a replacement for the main version of Manjaro. Now, immutable-based distros are getting more and more development, and I think this is going to be very interesting to see what Manjaro does with this. And if you are interested in learning more and trying it out for yourself, you'll find links in the show notes. Cybersecurity researchers from Graz, Graz University of Technology have identified a new exploitation technique named Slubstick, targeting the Linux kernel. Now, this technique is notable for its ability to escalate a limited heap vulnerability into an arbitrary memory read and write primitive, thereby circumventing existing security def defenses. Now, the key details for this particular exploit is the methodology. So the cross uh, cache attack, this is basically leveraging a timing side channel in the Linux memory allocator, enabling a cross cache attack with a high success rate above 99% on frequently used generic caches. Also, the technique allows attackers to modify kernel data, achieving an arbitrary memory read and write, which bypasses standard kernel defenses like KASLR or the kernel address space layout randomization. Also, uh, Slubstick has been demonstrated on Linux kernel versions 5.19 and 6.2. It exploits various security flaws such as double tree, use after free, and out of bounds rights. These vulnerabilities discovered between 2021 and 2023 allow for privilege escalation to, uh, to root without authentication and can lead to container escapes. Now, modern Linux kernels employ security features like supervisor mode access prevention or SMAP or KSLR that we talked about earlier, and also Kernel Control Flow Integrity, or KCFI, to make exploitation more challenging. And prior to cross-cache attack methods, uh, had success rate uh, only about 40%, making them less reliable compared to Slubstick. Now, for Slubstick to be effective, the presence of, the heap, of a heap vulnerability in the Linux kernel is required. So this is uh, not an easy thing to do. The attack also assumes that an unprivileged user has the capability to execute code on the targeted system. This means that this is by far not a dire exploit because the criteria for this exploit, it needs to function is fairly high and specific. So it's not an urgent issue for users to deal with this. But the discovery of Substick highlights the ongoing arms race between attackers and defenders in the realm of kernel security. And despite advanced defenses, sophisticated exploitation techniques like Slubstick demonstrate the potential for significant security breaches, uh, breaches, emphasizing the need for continuous improvements to the kernel hardening strategies. Super Grub 2 Disk 2.06 S4 has been released. <laughs> so Super Grub Disk 2 is a powerful tool designed to help users boot into various operating systems, especially in situations where the regular boot process fails. This release introduces several new features and improvements. So they've added a uh, ButterFS support. So it gives you compatibility for things that are, so a system that is using ButterFS can now be booted with this. Also, they have expanded OS support. So it now includes support for booting uh, GNU slash herd, React OS, and Linux directly from the slash boot partition. Also, they've improved secure boot compatibility. So they've updated secure boot binaries for Debian and Ubuntu, ensuring better functionality on recent UEFI systems. Also, they have some improvements to translations for people who uh, speak Hungarian, traditional Chinese, Polish, and Japanese. They also have new boot methods for a variety of operating systems like Windows, including older versions of Windows, like Windows 98 and Windows NT, as well as FreeBSD, FreeDOS, and macOS, and more. They've also redesigned the interface, so the overall interface has been improved for a better user experience. It's not the most modern looking thing, but it is improved from the previous version. Now, Super Grub 2 Disk is available for different architectures for booting. You have the IE386, 
8664, uh, i386 EFI, and x8664 EFI. And it supports booting from a variety of stuff, like USB, you would assume. Also, CD-ROM if you need to. And for some reason, if you have to, you can use it on a floppy disk. This version also addresses various bugs and introduces new tools for better management of secure boot settings. The hybrid version is recommended for users as it supports most machines, including older BIOS and modern UEFI systems. And for more detailed information and to download the new version, you can visit the official SuperGrub2 disk website. There have been some recent updates to the Sway i3-inspired Wayland compositor, which includes significant improvements, notably the merging of explicit sync support via the Linux-DRM-Sync Object-V1 protocol. This addition enhances how Wayland environments handle synchronization, particularly benefiting NVIDIA driver support. The explicit sync support was a long-awaited feature, and with the merge of this code, it makes a substantial advancement. Also, these enhancements combined with other recent updates, like adding support for Wayland's tearing control protocol, make the upcoming Sway release something the tiling window management community can look forward to, especially users relying on NVIDIA hardware. The Hyperland team have announced the latest release of their tiling Wayland compositor with version 0.42. For those unfamiliar, Hyperland is a compositor designed for tiling window management and at the same time aims to have a very appealing interface, which is in contrast to most tiling window managers that typically ignore visuals in almost every way. <laughs> I like how they describe it on their website homepage, tiling compositor with the looks. They also say that Hyperland provides the latest Wayland features, dynamic tiling, and all the eye candy as well as powerful plugins and much more. Now let's talk about the highlights of Hyperland 0.42. First of all, they removed the dependency of WL roots. In a significant departure from Wayland compositors, uh, Hi Hyperland 0.42 no longer relies on the WL roots library, which is commonly used for managing outputs, inputs, and other foundational functionalities. By building these components in-house, Hyperland aims to offer a more unique and efficient user experience. They've also added support for explicit sync. The new version introduces explicit sync support, which enhances rendering performance and reduces latency. And this feature allows the compositor to better manage the timing of screen updates, ensuring smoother performance and particularly helpful for NVIDIA GPU users. However, it may cause issues on certain NVIDIA configurations, so users have the option to disable it if necessary. Hyperland 0.42 also introduces a new Xcursor implementation designed to support legacy themes while improving compatibility and allowing for greater user customization. Also, users may need to modify their configurations due to changes in the settings related to uh, direct scan out because there are some breaking changes here in this latest release for those who are coming from an upgrade of previous version. Also, the fake full screen feature has been replaced by a more robust full screen state dispatcher. The new update also introduces a new dependency called Aquamarine, while the WL root submodule has been removed, reflecting the broader change in the compositor's architecture. And of course, with any new release of software, this version also includes a variety of bug fixes and other improvements. These updates reflect Hyperland's ongoing commitment to providing a cutting edge and customizable desktop experience. I have not had a chance to try it out for myself yet, but it certainly has my attention. Have you tried out Hyperland? And if you have, what are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on the show and want to be kept up to date with what's going on in the Linux and open source world, then be sure to subscribe. And of course, remember to like that smash button. If you'd like to support the show and the Tux Digital Network, then consider becoming a patron by going to tuxdigital.com slash membership, where you get a bunch of cool perks like access to patron-only sections of our Discord server and much much more. You can also support the show by ordering the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt or the This Week in Linux shirt at tuxdigital.com slash store. Plus, while you're there, we have a lot of cool stuff like hats, mugs, hoodies, and more. We even have a new collection where I added a new shirt called the I'm Unhackable shirt, which is a joke about the Destination Linux um, topic of uh, Jill having an unhackability because of the fact that she uses her uh, passwords are encrypted on a floppy disk. <laughs> so... Uh, check that out, tuxedos.com slash store. I'll see you next time for another episode of your source for Linux GNU's. 
Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell. I hope you're doing swell. Be sure to ring that notification bell. And until next time, I bid you farewell.